Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books. So pleased to be joined today by uh, the great Elizabeth Johnson uh, to talk about her new Orbis book, Come Have Breakfast, Meditations on God and the Earth. Uh, Elizabeth Johnson is Distinguished Professor of Theology Emerita at Fordham University. Uh, she's a former president of the Catholic Theological Society uh, and the winner of the Society's highest award, the John Courtney Murray Award. Uh, she is no doubt one of the foremost theologians in North America, in my book, I would say the world. Uh, her book, She Who Is, The Mystery of God and Feminist Theological Discourse, uh, won the Gravemeyer Award in Religion. She's well known for reflecting on basic Christian doctrines, uh, Jesus, God, uh, Mary, the communion of saints, from a feminist perspective. But for many years, she's been a pioneer in reconsidering Christian faith in relation to the natural world, the earth, and the threats posed by climate change. And this is particularly evident in her most recent books, uh, Ask the Beasts, Darwin and the God of Love, her previous Orbis title, Creation and the Cross, The Mystery of God for a Planet in Peril, and now her new book with Orbis, Come Have Breakfast. So uh, I'm, I'm so glad to, to welcome you here today. And I, I think a good place to start is with the title of your book, which is somewhat unfamiliar to many people, Biblical Reference. And a good way to do that would be, as I suggested, if you could read a little bit from the, the chapter that takes that same title, Come Have Breakfast. Would you share that with us? I would. And let me just preface this by saying, uh, you mentioned it's not a well-known biblical reference. <laughs> uh, if you ask people uh, who said this in the Bible, you pretty much draw a blank uh, from many people. And when you say that Jesus said it, it just seems amazing. It's not something that's well known. But clearly it comes from that gospel uh, story at the end of John's gospel, uh, when the disciples have been out on the lake all night and not caught anything, and Jesus tells them, let down the net, etc. And then when they get into the shore, he says, come have breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, and so that became the title of this. And I will just read a short a little series of passages from that meditation um, to sort of set the framework here. Come have breakfast. After calling out this invitation, Jesus served up a morning meal of bread and fish, which he had been cooking over a charcoal fire on the beach. Let us ponder these three simple words. Their dynamic opens up a portal into an ecological image of the living God, active with cordial hospitality toward all creatures, willing their good, wanting all to be fed. Now this is a post-resurrection story. And given his exalted status, it may seem odd that Jesus, now being confessed as Christ, Messiah, Son of God, the Word of God, that he would be busy with routine details of preparing and serving breakfast. Commentaries written by most theologians and biblical scholars across the centuries give short shrift to this behavior, mm -hmm. if indeed they address it at all. Traditional interpretations focus more on Jesus's words to Peter at the end of this story, feed my lambs, feed my sheep and therefore on the authority of Peter and papal successors in the institutional church, rather than on Jesus's words and actions serving breakfast. A certain gender bias may explain why this is the case. <laughs> I stop here and go on then in the meditation to show how often through the ministry, Jesus is concerned with people being fed, even comments that the birds, the heavenly father feeds them, the animals being fed and so on. And then I continue. Here a portal to a wider image of God begins to open. John's gospel has already identified Jesus as the word of God made flesh, full of grace and truth. 
Whoever sees him sees the gracious one who sent him. Using the bodily sense of hearing rather than seeing, theologian Edward Skillerbeck beautifully proposes that Jesus not only told parable, parables, but is himself the parable that God is telling to the world. So whoever hears him, hears what the creator wishes to communicate. In a word, Christ is the sacrament of the encounter with God. So come have breakfast. Jesus' nurturing words and actions channel the living God's hospitality to the world, the driving divine desire that all should be fed. The meditation then goes on to bring in the horror of world hunger, famine and starvation, the effect on children, the effect on animals, right? And goes on. Amid such acute unjust suffering, the divine summons to come have breakfast resounds with prophetic challenge. It cracks through the complacency of privileged people with insistence, stop global warming, make peace, change unjust business practices, feed the hungry, make it possible for every last creature to start the day with nourishing food. Does this matter to God? It does if we understand that the risen Jesus' interest in feeding others reveals God's nurturing care, which extends to the whole community of creation. Note the parallel between Jesus' action on the beach. He takes bread in his hands and gives it to the disciples. The parallel of that with divine action depicted in Psalm 145. This psalm praises the creator for being gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, good to all, and compassionate over all that has been made. And within this framework, it continues, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. What a wonderful poetic image this psalm offers. You know, the eagle eyes of the raptor, the multifaceted eyes of the fly, the reflective eyes of the cat, all animal eyes looking to God for food and God open-handedly obliging. Mm -hmm. Other psalms bring in God as the feeder of lions, as mm -hmm. the one who provides the ravens for their, with their food, especially the young ravens who are crying out to God for their food and so on. So to conclude, this meditation says, the giver of life who creates and sustains all creatures also wills their good, that they should flourish. Mm. So Jesus's invitation to come have breakfast is not an isolated oddity but a vital expression of God's nurturing relationship with all creatures of the living world. Mm -hmm. Let this powerful three-word phrase reverberate beyond the scripture text. And when we say the word God, let us hear this invitation to breakfast. Let it impel us to act for just distribution of food in human communities and protection of nourishing habitats for animals. The living God, creator of heaven and earth, passionately desires that all should be fed. Mm -hmm. I, I love that uh, meditation. And, and although it comes uh, at the end of the book, it, it, it does sum up so many of the, of the themes, especially the the emphasis on, on the living God as creator and creator is not just something that happened, you know, at the big bang or, or the first seven days, uh, but is, is something ongoing and implies a relationship, an ongoing relationship, uh, not just between God and, and human beings, 
uh, but that we are all uh, part of this web of of, of creation. I, I I loved when you said that one of your purposes in kind of writing this book was that that we would not use we would not use the word God without thinking also of the earth, without thinking of creation, God and creation uh, t t together. That's sort of a theme that kind of, well, runs through everything in the book, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. Because in my experience, when we say creation, most people think of in the beginning, yes. Genesis. Mm -hmm. And rightly so. I mean, that's correct. But it doesn't stop there. Now that I'm retired, I said it almost people read Genesis as if on the seventh day when God rested, that that extended into a long retirement yeah. <laughs> up until now, you know, but the doctrine of creation includes continuous creation. Every second, every instant, everything that exists is empowered by the infinite love and energy of God. And without that, there would be no thing, nothing. And so God is in relationship to the animals, to the plants, to all that exists. And on earth, that's an entire network, a whole community of life at every instant. There's a great metaphor that is in the book. It's that um, God creates the world, not like a sculptor who creates a statue and then leaves it alone, mm. but like a singer yes. who keeps on singing her song in order for the music to last. And when it stops, then there's no more music. Uh, it's a live performance, in other words, on the part of God. And that isn't something that, although it's in very uh, profoundly in scripture and also in our doctrine, we haven't paid attention to that. And uh, part of my conviction in writing this book and hope is that by meditating on this, by praying with this understanding, we'll widen out our understanding of God as creator, which will then get us more active in loving and caring for the earth. When you speak of, of, of the singer singing her song, uh, that song also includes this chorus of all creation. Um, and right. you know, all of the references in the Psalms that you, that you in, invoke about uh, all creation praises uh, God. Uh, what does that mean? It's not an anthropomorphic reality at its essence. I mean, it does, creatures, we humans praise, means we sing, we thank, we dance, we celebrate. And we. it's wrong to think that animals, plants, star, have that consciousness that mm -hmm. humans have. It's different, we're all different. Mm -hmm. But when um, scripture is filled with the understanding that creation praises, it was Augustine who says, they praise just by being who they are, mm -hmm. by their very natural ways of going about existing. They're giving glory back to God who created them and so on. Mm -hmm. um, by the ravens crying out for their food, they're giving praise. So the scriptures use all kinds of metaphors. For this. They shout, they roar, uh, the trees clap their hands, all kinds of uh, images that creation is in reference always to the one who made them and sustains them and in fact will complete them. It, it's what we've always said about the human beings now put into a wider framework of all of creation is included in this. The, um, we have tended to, you know, in the West, Kind of separate ourselves, human beings, from from creation. We're the pinnacle, the the peak of this hierarchy of of, of being, right. uh, and therefore uh, it's sort of God in us, uh, and we we have lost that sense of of relationship with the entire creation of which we're actually intimately embedded and related. Uh, what what are the implications in our in our current current uh, crisis of the earth? Uh, from that kind of distinction that we make? There's two things I think we need to really be working on in the, in the area of theology in the church, in those who believe in God, who are Christian. And one is um, the vision of God as broader than ourselves, as you mentioned in the West, that got very narrowed down to human sinfulness. Mm -hmm. And the redemption that Jesus 
brought to us on the cross. And that, of course, is true. That the human sinfulness that we see around us is horrific these days, the violence and so on. Um, but that's not all there is to the story. But we focused on that for the last thousand years in the West, as you said, in our liturgies, in our prayer, and in, in the way we understand Jesus and so on. And we neglected the wider context uh, that is there in scripture and that the Eastern church has not forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so the, the first um, thing to say is, uh, the notion of God is created encompasses all of creation and is God is not only interested in human beings. I had someone, a student asked me, one, but isn't God more interested in human beings than in other creatures? And that was a good question, I thought. And we certainly were taught that. It was certainly the way you would assume, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, what came to my mind was to say, how do you parse infinite love? Mm -hmm. Infinite love is infinite mm -hmm. and is infinite in all directions. And it's all encompassing. And so I'm not one to, to say, I mean, how do I know <laughs> who loves? You know? But but it's it's just all are encompassed. And we are all connected uh, biologically and historically through evolution and so on, but also spiritually and theologically. There is, while we're all different types of creatures, the interdependence makes us one community. And um, this is what the first thing that we need to understand about God's encompassing love. But the second thing is we ourselves have been extremely arrogant in the West and put ourselves, as you said, on that pinnacle. Mm -hmm. and made ourselves be the end all and be all and that we can look at other creatures and just see them as resources that we can use for our own good mm -hmm. rather than respect them in their own reality as creatures of God not that we can't use them but it changes the whole atmosphere once you re recognize that they are also beloved of God you, you um one of the there's so many wonderful little stories that that you tell in in, in quotations but but one that's uh, that stands out in you I think you used it in your your previous book with us too of of John Muir's coming upon a uh, carcass of a of a bear in in in, uh, in in the park you know whatever in the wilderness Yosemite yeah Yosemite yeah and and he he says that you know for most Christians would would feel that the soul of this bear or something doesn't doesn't matter or, or 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 has no lasting significance and what what was the line that he he uses that's so great he says but on the contrary he said the the pious folk that he knew would not let this bear into heaven they yeah. think that heaven is reserved just for themselves and yeah. then he says but on the contrary god's charity is broad enough for bears right well, and when, when I say, you know, I say, is it? I mean, do we really think that? <laughs> this these series of meditations is trying to open our minds and hearts to that truth. Well, as you point out, uh, Pope Francis essentially echoes that uh, that that point in Laudato Si, also, doesn't he? Where he he talks about the end time when we'll, I think, don't know if he used the word heaven or something like that, when we'll be kind of see face to face not just god but but all of of creation and all of its it's the last full paragraph of laudato si and he says and all creatures all creatures resplendently transfigured uh -huh. will share with us in unending bliss he talks about the interest intrinsic value of every creature even even those like a, a mayfly or something that only live for a few hours right right said so that they are in uh, encompassed and surrounded with affection, divine affection. One of the, uh, you know, are really things that really arrested my mind uh, was when you're talking about about Jesus and his teachings and his references constantly to to nature, where he talks about the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that is an answer to the question, who is my neighbor? And what difference would it make if we recognized other creatures, the earth as as also as our neighborhood, and all of its creatures as a, as our as our neighbors? Right, right. Now, I mean that's that's clearly as part of can nature be our neighbor, is a, a controversial 
question. You know, I raise it. I argue, yes, obviously, but others would not agree. Um, we're working through, we're on a new, we're in a new period where the signs of the times, to quote the Second Vatican Council, are calling us to pay attention to ourselves and those among us who are in need and so on in the wider context of creation of on our, especially on our planet right now, mm -hmm. which is in a crisis mode and moving very rapidly to a tipping point in terms of climate warming. Um, which will have terrible effects on everyone, every creature, humans, and especially the poor. So it's like, wake up, everybody, and take this seriously. I, I am continuously struck how it would be really good if our Eucharistic prayers, uh, the prayers we say at Mass, and also selection from the lectionary could reflect this wider earth consciousness. Uh, we're still using... I think Tridentine prayers that are very focused on uh, sacrifice and our sin and that, and that should not disappear. Don't get me wrong. It's not an either or, but that within the wider context of where we are sinning against our neighbor needs to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, um, you talk also about, um, well, there's you know, the whole theme of suffering that runs through all nature red and tooth and claw and that you know it's not a it's not a sentimental or romantic kind of idea that that uh nature is just all pretty things uh there's also tragedy there's also loss there's also death that's that's woven into it um uh, and how do you relate that to the kind of paschal story and the story of of jesus's death and resurrection right well, I, I should uh, like to mention that the, the book itself is structured in a beginning with creation, but then moving a whole section on Jesus mm -hmm. and then moving forward to ourselves once again, onwards with the Holy Spirit. So it's a, in a way a Trinitarian framework. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the understanding today is that Jesus among us going into death is in solidarity with all creatures who die. Now, we've always said that with human beings, mm -hmm. that we who die, Jesus is with us, knows what it means to suffer, knows what it means to die. And we have companionship, you might say, uh, of Christ within us in those moments with a hope for something more. But the understanding of Jesus now among us as part of the flesh of the earth, which is not just our own bodies, but we are connected with all the flesh of other creatures and of the whole material substratum of the whole earth, is that the death of Jesus puts him in solidarity with all creatures who die, accompanies them through that annihilating moment with the hope of something more. Mm -hmm. So the, the Paschal mystery is cosmic in its scope it's not for humans only mm -hmm. um but it's for all all of creation will be redeemed i mean that is how the whole new testament the bible begins with all creation coming forth from the hand of god and it ends with all creation being redeemed i mean it's and christ is at the center of that for christians mm -hmm. that that you know the the consequences of that uh, tendency of ours to separate ourselves out from the rest of, of creation, and that uh, that is proves so threatening to our own survival. Uh, I, I think was clear in a little passage where you you talk to, you say consider the trees, uh, and and what that tells us about our our relationship and our interdependence with with the rest of creation. Well, that, that's a wonderful, uh, again, image. In the hierarchy of truths, we start out with non-living material like rocks. Plants are above them. Animals are above them. Humans are above that. And angels are above us. And it all has to do with this separation of spirit and matter. So whichever creature has more spirit is higher up in the hierarchy of being. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, we are higher than the trees. But when you think about it biologically, the trees take in carbon dioxide and their waste product is oxygen and they create 
atmosphere and biological or historians of the earth say without the algae and the green plants and the trees, there would be no atmosphere mm. and therefore no humans, no, no one who breathes with the lungs and needs oxygen. So we are dependent on the trees for the very air we breathe. And the question that I raise, so who needs who more? Mm -hmm. And who we're interdependent. What we do to the trees, we cut them down and we use them for building and firewood and so on. And and what but what they do for us is give us the very breath of life. Um and so to open up our minds to an interdependence is uh it's profoundly spiritual to do that, mm -hmm. to, to expand our own love in that regard, but it's based on the notion that we're totally in need of the creation around us, even for our own lives to flourish. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, just as an, I, I, I should say the, the, those who are listening should, should know also of, of the just wonderful playfulness of your language, uh, in, in this book, especially when, when you, uh, list, you know, various kinds of creatures and the kind of fun you seem to have with that and so in talking about that kind of hierarchy of being uh you refer to uh pebbles peaches poodles persons Person. and the principalities and powers the angels of pure spirits but yeah <laughs> uh, I, I i do think that there's a, yeah the, the 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 there's a kind of overflow of just uh uh, zest and aliveness in, in, in your writing and in these meditations that makes them so delightful to read. There's not like listening to a a, a dry sermon or, or a theological uh, text and uh, readers uh, should know that. I, I want to sh w share with, with on the screen here uh, a detail from the cover of your book, uh, which we, we decided to, to use. Wonderful kind of icons of endangered species by a wonderful artist named Angela Mano. Uh, and I, I'm just going to put that up on the screen for a second and ask you to uh, reflect on what, can you see that there? Yeah. Yeah. What that sort of signifies uh, to you, the, the, that image. I can make well, it. Angela uh, Mano is a, a marvelous uh, artist whose um, practice has been to take members of endangered species and each uh, animal pictured here is in, a member of an endangered species and to paint them in the manner of Eastern Orthodox icons mm -hmm. uh, to bring forth in a way their spiritual qualities to, to make them precious and mm -hmm. show them in their beauty so that we would be motivated to move to prevent their extinction mm -hmm. and to keep them as members of the communion of life here on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a beauty there. There's a profound sense of respect for the animal, the insect, the, uh, of course, with the penguin and the little chick, that's a come have breakfast <laughs> picture <laughs> right there from one feeding the other. But in each case, the a bird and the bee, uh, getting nectar from the flowers that's also breakfast um the, the earth feeding feeding one another mm -hmm. the uh i can take that down the um there's such a sense of of uh, you know the beauty of all these creations the beauty of the earth but they're you know in line with that idea of of all creatures kind of praising god you talk about uh, with extinction, the mass extinctions, this kind of silencing of of the praise of God. Uh, the we think that oh, as long as there were people in church, uh, God is being praised and everything like that. But there's this kind of uh, uh, silent. Well, you know, uh, Rachel Carson's book si Silent Spring that referred to you know the the uh, absence of birdsong because of, of of DDT and this idea that that our our planet our world is is growing smaller uh and what the theological spiritual implications of that are right laudato c makes a wonderful statement about this it, it speaks about every uh 
year, more and more species are going extinct. These are living creatures whom our children will never see. Mm. We are lessening creation's praise of God by doing that and lessening the revelation of God that these creatures can bring to us. We have no such right. Mm. Um, it, it's a, a very strong sense of the power of creatures to reveal God to us, the beauty of God, the love of God, the compassion of God. And by wiping out thousands of species, which is happening as we speak, um, we're robbing the God of this praise. We're robbing creation's ability even to praise, and therefore our own is getting weaker. It, it's a very theological uh, argument if in terms of... Um, the necessity to prevent extinctions as possible. I, I have done this and I say in the book, you can go Google extinction, the word extinction and put in the year. Mm -hmm. So Google extinction 2023, and you can create your own book of the dead. Mm -hmm. Because they're listing, the scientists are keeping lists. And once the ex uh, a species goes extinct, it can never come back. It's a product of an evolutionary history which won't be repeated. And so, as Jonathan Shell once said, um, with extinction, we kill birth, mm, mm. not just species. No more babies, no more seeds, no more future for that line of creation. Mm. It, it's tragic, and, and it's happening rapidly. You speak, uh, I, I don't know whether it was Augustine or, or who, uh, you know, I, I guess it's a traditional idea that there are kind of two books of, of God's revelation, the book of scripture and the book of nature. Right. And we have uh, not seen them as related to each other. We are insensible to that uh, book of nature is telling us something about, about uh, God. Right. Um, and... Um, uh, well, what you know, the implications of of that. What one of the things you that that you kind of remind the reader is just how much scripture is overflowing with references to nature. Uh, and when we usually think of the Bible, we think of these stories that in, in, involve the you know the, the patriarchs and Moses and Jesus and the disciples that sort of thing. Uh, and un, until you know, I really reflecting on the quotations you have from the Psalms, et cetera, and you know, realize this, what you call zoological gaze, uh, that nature is just pervaded. Maybe even, you know, uh, scripture itself is a book of nature. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting way to put it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there are, I learned this years ago when I first started uh, doing feminist theology <clears throat> and was started scouting scripture for images of God in female form. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the process, I kept seeing these nature images and also nature itself as cared for by God, but nature images for God also, like rock and bird, mm -hmm. so on, that I use in the meditations. And so for this series of meditations, I did the same th thing as I did in feminist theology. I went scouring so it's it's like when you ask a certain question the way you frame the question certain things come into view that wouldn't be there if you didn't ask that question mm -hmm. and so by doing that you know when to to praise god you are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the far distant seas and the thought struck me that god is the hope of the far distant seas and from where I'm sitting in New York, that that means the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Southern Ocean. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. and, and who is the God I am praying to? Who is the God of the sea, the far distant seas? Um, it just said to, I said to myself, there's tremendous number of pointers like that all through scripture that, that in a, a more human-centered notion you you would tend to ignore they, they didn't seem spiritual enough you know mm -hmm. but really i what i'm asking throughout this book it, it's a god book really another god i'm asking the question who is god and if 
and end up with the idea of God is the one who says to all creatures, come have breakfast. Mm -hmm. And that means something for the way we should live who believe in this God. Mm. Um, it's it's that simple. It's just trying to put more of a, um, a sense of God as the creator of all and redeemer of all and lover of all up front. So it's it's not counteracting the tradition is going into the tradition, pulling something forward that has been very much overlooked and is very much uh, needed right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that might be a good place to to end. I'm going to put your your cover back on the on the screen there. And uh, I'd like to, if I could, Robert, just read one line from oh, Laudate please. Deum, please. Uh, which um, I think sums it up. This was not published when I was writing this book, so it's not in the book. Uh, but Pope Francis writes, the world sings of an infinite love. How can we fail to care for it? Indeed. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, for writing this book, for publishing with Orbis. Uh, and I certainly urge everyone to rush out and uh, buy this book, which will be available very shortly. Uh, Elizabeth Johnson's Come Have Breakfast, Meditations on God and the Earth. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>